hello, welcome. I, I, I don't know um, what student is down there, but we're excited to have you here. I think they're gonna slowly trickle in. Again, this is a, an in and out sort of um, opportunity for students um, to come in as they please over the next 45 minutes. Um, but just a reminder for those who will be watching this recording, um, this is Entrepreneurship in Action. Um, we are very excited to, to get started. Um, this was requested by the students um, to have an engagement opportunity to ask real entrepreneurs questions about their ideas and idea developments, um, concepts and problem solving. Um, today, and of course, all of our entrepreneurs and residents, please feel free to edit um, the titles that I have written down for you. But uh, I have Sue McGraw, who is the CEO of St. John's Hospice, which I believe is your most recent endeavor. Um, you have quite, quite a wonderful profile. Um, I have Matthew McDonald, who is a social entrepreneur and currently founding director of the nonprofit's Shared Future and Melodrum Mobile Stage. Um, I have Len Rainford, who's the franchise director, um, business consultant and entrepreneur for, for this franchise specialist. So I think if you don't mind, um, if you want to go ahead and just perhaps elaborate a little bit on those current endeavors that you're working on, um, just to give everyone who will be watching later the opportunity to know a little bit more about what you're doing, I think that would be a great way to start. Um, and then as they come in, I'll ask them to, to put questions in the chat or turn off their mics. Um, whoever wants to start, I mean, please go right ahead. Ladies first. <laughs> okay, Sue. Okay, I'll start. Um, I suppose um, I, I run an organization that has, um, we, have, we, have, we, we have an ambition to be an ambidextrous organization. So we have real roots in the ground stuff, which is, hands-on nursing and medical care 24 hours a day for people who are at the end of their life and that's not funded fully in the um, in, in the UK so about 30 percent of our funding comes from the National Health Service but the rest of it and it's five million pounds a year to run the organization we have to think of creative ways to get our community or the people we might support to, to fundraise for the organization. So our ambidexterity is about um, stability on the one hand, so your roots in the ground, what you're known for, compassion, care, um, you know, be, being outstanding at what we do in that respect. But the other hand is about agility. So how can we have a go at things? How can we, how can we take this little old organization that's been doing the same thing for 35 years and kind of have that agility to have a go at some crazy events. This weekend, we've got a thousand people who in, in a part of Cumbria where I am, um, will throw paint at each other and do a colour dash. And they've all raised at least 50 quid. And, and that's how we, we do this. You know, we've got a, I was at a meeting last night where we're going to do an amazing golf day. We know we'll raise 15,000 pounds. We run a little cafe that makes about £40,000 a year, but in a way, we almost don't care that that makes money. It brings people in, gets them to see what we do. Um, they, they come in and then we say, well, have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? We've got a lottery. We've got nine shops. We're constantly trying to think about the next the next thing that someone might do to, um, to support us. So that's us really, roots in the ground around the care. We don't compromise on any of that. We don't, we don't dilute it. It's always gonna be outstanding. But the other hand is about being an agile organization that's prepared to have a go at some stuff. And our board, who are quite brave, um, allow us to fail if we fail fast. <laughs> so that's us. That is, that's absolutely amazing. You said some really crucial components, I think, you know, having a board that supports you, but also um, having, allowing creativity in a medical space. I think that's absolutely wonderful. Um, and I know I'm going to have questions, but I'll, I'll let everyone else ask ahead of time. Um, okay, I think, Matthew, you're next on my screen. Okay. Um, where to start? I've been, as well as an academic, which has been my career, I've been a serial entrepreneur all my life. And it quickly became apparent to me that just making money just produced lots of tokens. And I'm always asking myself, what should those be spent on? And it's that approach that's led me into this field of social entrepreneurship, of social enterprise. So 
I'm currently the director of three social enterprises, two of which you've mentioned, the first of which shared future. We work to give citizens voice. So we undertake projects around citizens assemblies and around participatory budgeting to engage people in usually the work of their local municipality, their local government. The other social enterprise that I'm involved in is called the Melodrome Mobile Stage. And it's a very local theatre that mounts into a trailer so we can take performance to areas, to audiences who don't have a theatre. They may live rurally, they may live in a rundown part of um, a city where they don't have access to facilities. We run about half our events are commercial events, usually for local towns who want something, a particular event in their town centre. And that subsidises our work with communities that otherwise couldn't afford us. So that's really the basis. It's about what are we making money for? These are both for profit businesses, but it's about what's the value that we're creating beyond just making money. Both of them are profit making, both of them are self-supporting, but it's about what we do with that money, how we invest that in the communities we serve. Okay. Thank you so much. And I actually did one of my first internships with a social enterprise. And so I, I it, it rings really true to my heart and it's definitely an up and coming um, business and nonprofit platform. Um, okay, Len, do you want to, to take stage here, if you will, and, and um, introduce yourself? Yeah, Len Rainford, otherwise known as the franchise specialist. Uh, that sums it up. <laughs> um, I've been uh, involved in franchising now for well over 30 years. Um, I have had five different businesses, all in different sectors since my early 20s. Um, my last business, uh, I formed a company called Same Day UK. I started it from scratch. I built it up into over a million pound turnover. Uh, had lots of ups and downs over the years. Had it for 16 years. And I sold it back in 2013 and decided to work uh, as the franchise specialist. Uh, as I've been involved in it for so long, it made sense to do that. Uh, most of the people I work with are companies uh, that are, are new to franchising, they want to franchise the business, don't know how to do it, they need the help to do it. Uh, but I also get involved in the other side, people looking to buy a franchise. Uh, in fact, every every aspect of franchising, really, uh, I get involved in. And um, as I say, I've been involved in it for 40 years now, so it's, um, it's still a growing market in the UK. I think in the USA, franchising is just... Everybody knows about franchising. Virtually every company is franchised. I remember going to America many years ago and I went in the stationery shop at the airport and I couldn't believe how many books were in there on franchising. Whereas in the UK at the time, there was one book on franchising. Um, you know, and I think even now in the UK, although there are over 900 franchise brands, it's still, you know, a lot of people, I, I work with a lot of the schools and colleges and virtually hardly any, in fact, hardly any universities teach franchise in the, in the business degrees, which is, I just find amazing when there's so many franchises in the UK now. Um, so I'm a big believer in promoting the franchise, um, franchise type of business. On a personal level, um, as well as getting, you know, I've been involved with Lancaster University now for the last 12 years. Um, I also am involved with the local Chamber of Commerce and the local schools. I do a lot of mentoring in schools. And I'm a member of the Rotary Club. Um, again, an, an organisation that many people haven't got a clue what it's about. But if you do know what it is, we do a tremendous amount of work in the, in the local community. Uh, and I'm chairman of the community committee at the moment. Um, so we do, we do a, you know, obviously we we interact with as many businesses in the local community as we can to promote to promote the ideas of Rotary. So that's me, Len Rainford. Yep, the franchise specialist. That's amazing. I I mean, even when I was in my business studies, I didn't get to learn a lot about franchising, and I think that that you're absolutely right. It's it's crucial. Um, so now. 
Uh, I want to open the floor for anyone who has questions. Um, I noticed one of our students has turned his camera on. I don't know if he would like to ask a question via video or via chat, but um, please feel free um, to, to raise your hands or to um, ask a question in the chat. I see we have a hand raise, Abed. Um, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself or if you would like to ask the question in the chat. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Oh, good morning. Maybe it's morning uh, with you. Uh, I am Abed Shaima. Uh, I'm an Algerian student. I study business. I am uh, one of the participants in Africa Business Competition. Uh, it's really very cool. What are you doing, guys, for our continent? It's, uh, yeah, we can raise our head uh, with that. I just have a question. Uh, you have chosen the sixth group. I mean, is it a final uh, final decision? Don't, don't we have another chance? Yes, so that is actually a question for, for the competition. Um, and yes, those six teams have been chosen. Um, if you would like feedback, please feel free um, to send me an email and let me know. Um, it's a great question. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, that our wonderful entrepreneurs and residents um, don't know the the um, exact specificities and um, programmatic elements of the competition. So um, if we want to keep those questions more entrepreneurial related, I think that would be great. But if you have a question on the competition, please feel free um, to let me know. I hope that helps. Inshallah. Okay, thank you. Inshallah. Um, okay, do we have any additional questions? Um, if not, I of course have a list of questions. Um, let's see here. Okay, I actually would like to start on problem framing. So I, I mentioned this a little bit before um, we got started, um, that we have the students focus quite a bit on problem fr framing and identifying a problem, um, especially a local problem. Can you please um, either talk about some of those some of those important components of identifying a problem or um, how that is important to starting a business and keeping a business going. Can anyone touch on that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, if it's okay, I'll address that first. Um, coming from academia, so I've, all, I've been involved with lots of students who come up with business ideas and promote new business ideas as part of competitions like this and internally to their own universities, but also out in the community. I see that people come up with good ideas and my advice is always to take a step back and to look at what the unmet needs are of those that you're serving, and then to look at what ideas might address those. And I feel sometimes that people start with their good ideas rather than with what are the problems you're trying to address? Really, what's the unmet needs of your particular customers or potential customers? And how will you develop your product or your service to address those needs? And so it's not an answer to the question, it's really to re-emphasize the importance of it, that to me, for a social enterprise, for a socially focused business, that it's about meeting unmet needs well before you come up with your wonderful idea. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. I don't know, Sue and, and Len, if you had any other um, additional comments on that. Yeah, I can perhaps add to that, really. Um, we recently did an exercise here where, um, because we're always looking for new markets where we might attract funding, because we've constantly got to find, find money every, every year. We've got to you know, start again. It's not as if we get the money and that's it. You know, we've got to keep looking. So we, we do a real kind of strategic analysis of the markets that we're in. And we think about in our community, because we serve a very specific geographical community, in this community, where are our donors? Who are they? Why are they supporting us? And are there any markets that we could move into that um, that could that that could be lucrative for us? And so we did a very definite strategic mapping process where we looked at, um, for example, um, we we look after people who are over at the age of eighteen. But very often people over the age of 18 might have young people in their families and we don't do anything with the young people. So we've just developed a young people service because they're the donors of the future. If we've looked after someone that they love, 
they are potentially lifelong donors. You know, we look after people who work, who, who die. So, so I think that that's, you're right, framing the problem, taking a step back, but then really analyzing the market beautifully and thinking about who in the space in which you operate are you perhaps not touching? And is there an opportunity to make some income there? Absolutely, and especially in the, in the field that, that you're in. Uh, Leroy, I see your hand has been raised for a little bit. Um, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah, so I actually have uh, a series of uh, questions. So I will just ask it as a chain question. Okay. So, yes. Uh, so I wanted to hear... Uh, for profit making uh, sort of social entrepreneurship ventures that if both uh, they have like a business model that is uh, profit making, but then they are sort of, um, they have a lot of social impact. Can you uh, sort of approach uh, maybe donors which are focused on social, social ventures to find your, to, say to sort of find your venture? Or do you specifically go for those um, uh, initiatives that target uh, for profit organization organizations? Then also, I wanted to get, uh, for example, when you actually haven't uh, finished up achieving all your milestones to, uh, to start a venture, how best do you present it to the to the investors and donors? Yeah, thank you. Great. So uh, just to summarize that a little bit, it looks like um, Leroy is asking about questions for funding um, specifically um, for those community development ideas, um, as well as advice on pitches. So I don't know, Len, if you wanted to um, say a few words. Yeah, yeah I, I you know, was thinking back to what uh, Sue just said as well. Um, I, I've, I'm a bit unusual, I suppose. I started five businesses over the years since I was in my early 20s. And most of them I've started with my own money. Um, and I wasn't, you know, my mum and dad worked in a factory, so, you know, I wasn't born rich or anything like that. Uh, but I sort of bought my first house when I was 21 and uh, just saved up money and I sold it and I used that money, the profit, to start my first business. And I've always been a big believer in, you know, the less you bought, the better. Um, I think, you know, in, in this day and age, it's the same in the UK as it is over there. Uh, people immediately want funding. They want, you know, they want people to support the business. They want the funding. They want somebody to put money into the business, invest in the business. Um, I, I view it probably differently than a lot of people. I think the less you borrow, the better. And if you look at the, UK, the figures in the UK, um, over 45% of businesses fail in the first two years. And the, the reason for that is, is a lot of it is finance. They just, they just haven't worked out the finances properly. I mean, to me, there, there are sort of four aspects to any business that are critical. One is the administration, two is the operation, three is the finance, and four is the sales and marketing. And I've always said, without sales, you haven't got a business, full stop. So you can be the best painter in the world, you can be the best joiner in the world, or whatever you're doing. But if you don't get sales, if you don't bring in customers, then you ain't got a business. And, and the combination of that and finance is one of the main reasons why 45% of companies fail in, in the UK in the first couple of years. I think you had a lot of great things uh, to say. Len, I believe you're frozen on my screen. I don't know if you're frozen on anyone else's. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hopefully he he reconnects with us. Um, Matt, yeah. uh, Len, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Len? Yeah, I can, yeah. Okay, we lost you for, for a minute. I believe, again. I believe he's frozen again. Matt, if you would like to say anything in addition. Yes. In many ways, I come from a different business background from Len, but I would agree that 
all of my businesses, which are always done with other people, I call them my own, they never are, they're with teams of people, but the main resource we rely on is people. We're not looking for financial resources to launch these businesses. They have to be self-sustaining to prove their concept, to make show people what they're worth. The melodrome stage for the first time in 11 years is looking for some charitable funding at the moment to help us repair some of the equipment and to get us into communities that we might otherwise not serve. But we can only do this with a track record of 10, 11 years of practice to show what we can do. The other part of Leroy's question is about how we capture that. And we personally capture that through individual stories. We can say 10,000 people have been to our events, but it doesn't mean anything to me. What means something to me is the individual stories of people who have come to volunteer, who have their own lives have grown, their own experiences, they've gone on to do other things. So we tend to capture individual stories to show the value of what we offer. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Len, I see you're back on. I don't know if you wanted to conclude with anything else. Sorry, we lost you there. Yeah, I, I just think, you know, again, you touched on it, and is the, when it, with any setting up any new business, it, it, it's about the planning. You, you've got to have a plan, you've got to have a, a system in place. And, you, you know, as I said, sales to me is the most important thing. If you haven't got sales, you haven't got a business. Um, but you need all those things in place. And especially if you're going to borrow money, whether it's somebody investing in the company or whether it's, you know, even from your family, you know, at the end of the day, they probably want it back at some point. Um, so you, you've got to get everything to make sure that you, you, you know, you're operating. It's okay when you, you, you know, in five years down the line and your business is successful and you want to grow it even more, then people will invest and, and there's nothing wrong with it that and you know taking on a new investor or a new new director or whatever um but in the early days i just think it's crucial you know to get the to plan the finances and, and the sales right you know i think it's very crucial absolutely do i see your hand is raised and the dogs are barking so i'm gonna let you answer <laughs> Okay, I was, I think I'm just following on again, but I do think that, um, and, and I think Leroy, you mentioned about the pitch, how you pitch it to people. And we never do anything here without a patient story, without you just, you, you, you allow someone who might be about to invest in, in, in what you do, you allow them to walk in the shoes of someone that's had the benefit of your organization, who's had the benefit of amazing care, who can really kind of speak beautifully about the deep sense of purpose that your organization has and I think if you if you're pitching to if you're selling to people the best thing you can do is is have a, a really that sense of a deep sense of purpose and and what's in it for people and um and I, I just think that certainly the work I do which is about care um there is nothing more powerful than, than a patient and family story. So that's really important for a pitch in, in, the, in the voluntary sector, which is where I work. Thank you so much, Leroy. I hope this, this helps you a little bit. I don't know if you had a follow-up question as I know you did have a series. Yes, I, I think most of the questions I, I wanted to, to, to hear answers for have been answered. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, they were answered uh, comprehensively, and I also had some takeaways. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leroy. If you have anything else to add, I mean, please feel free to include it in the chat. Um, I think at this time, Abed, I, I believe you wanted to say a few words about your project. Um, actually, we just lost her. So perhaps she, when she comes back, I believe she wanted a little bit of feedback on um, her idea. So um, when she returns, perhaps we can um, address those. But um, I don't know if there were any follow-up questions to anything that's been said recently, or if um, anyone else, Nathaniel, Greta, oh, we're, oh, I think we lost Greta, but that's okay, people are coming in and out. Um, and Theo, I don't know if you had anything to add as well. Okay. Um, Daniela, at this time, I think has all this. Oh, you do? Hello? I know, I got nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay. If you do, let, let us know. Um, okay. okay, Daniela, I think you had a list of questions. I don't know if you um, anything resonated with you or to ask anything in, in particular. Um, 
Yeah, well, I just pulled up uh, the list here. Uh, Maddie and I were brainstorming for a little bit uh, for this exact scenario, just in case nobody, everyone's still thinking about some questions, you know, we're processing. Um, so I guess one question that I'm very curious about um, to ask you guys is, how do you define success as an entrepreneur? And I think that's a great question because you all three come from very different uh, backgrounds. Um, so take it away. Shall I? Um, after you, Len, or? Yeah, go on. No, yeah, okay, after you. Okay. I define success as through those stories that I talked about and that Sue's also talked about. What are those journeys that people have gone through with being involved in the businesses that I support, that I work with? What are their journeys? Have, are their lives better for it? As a social enterprise person, as a social entrepreneur, that's what's most important. Having said that, none of that can happen unless the business works, unless the business generates enough to keep it going and a surplus to allow us to improve, to reinvest, to grow. Uh, so there's two answers, one of which is the business has to work because we're not reliant on community fundraising or on foundations and trusts. We're not a charity. But there's no point in running the business for me unless it produces those journeys for people that provide them with some joy or an improved life or an improved life of the community around them. Wonderful. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Len, I see you're off mute. Yeah. Um, I think, what was the question again? Exact, the exact question. The question was, how do you, as an entrepreneur, define success? Yeah. Um, I think <sighs> profit, money, and, and all the other things involved in that side are, are very important, obviously. But um, in all my businesses that I've had, um, I think the, the two, two of the most important things are your staff, the people you're dealing with, and your customers. And if you treat them properly, you know, there's a lot of companies in, in this country who don't, you know, they're just out and out to build a business and get the money in and all the rest of it. And I've always been of the mindset that, you know, nearly all my, well, all, virtually all my businesses, all my customers talk to me. I can give you umpteen examples. My staff, you know, in my last business, which I sold 16 years ago, well, it's only 2013. The staff, my staff still speak to me. They still ring me up. We still chat to each other. They ring me up for advice. And I think that is because of, you, you know, the businesses I've built. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. I had uh, two, two gymnasiums, health clubs uh, with spas and whatnot uh, way back. And I sold them. Um, and... People, I, I was still living in the area where one of them was, and 12 months later, the, the people who bought it were begging me to buy it back off them. And the people who attended there used to meet me in the street and say, Len, why don't you buy that business back? We're missing you. Because the people who bought it didn't treat them like, you know, like I did. Um, and I think it's, you know, it, it, when I sold Same Day UK, which was my biggest company back in 2013, um, what do they call them? Um, it'll come to me in a big company in, in the UK. And when I told the, the director I was selling the business, um, they were like, oh, no, please don't. <laughs> you know, because they'd had about five different suppliers before they started using us. And I think that to me is touching on, like, it's what Matt said. It's a company, it's none of my businesses have been. Um, how can I put it, what's the word, you know, the social or ent social enterprises or anything like that. But I do think the um, that side of it is important while building a business, you know, to get to know your customers, get to know your staff inside out, 
you know, and, and not just be direct and say, you do this, you do that, you do the other. The, the more relationships that you can build up with, with your customers and your, and your suppliers and your staff is, is, to me, is crucial. And it makes a massive difference to running a business, you know, definitely. That is, can I, can I just add to that, Maddie? Um, I was, I was just going to say, I think, um, how would I define success? It's that beautiful balance between, as Len says, running, running a really great business, bringing the money in, but maintaining a reputation. I think it's important. And I don't just mean a reputation with your customers or the people who might be donors or supporters, but with your team as well. I just think you have to have happy staff and I think that that is really really important and reputation certainly in the world in which I work reputation is absolutely everything and I actually have a totally agree. I have a follow-up question to a kind of you know a little bit of of what Len said and and Sue your background I think Matt too how do you and when do you decide you know as a, a serial entrepreneur as, a, as the term is um to leave one business to start a new one, how does that transition happen? Is it organic? Do you wake up one day and are you like, okay, I'm done with this, let's move on? But how does that usually look for you? Do you want to go back? Um, yeah, I will. Because I, I get asked this a lot because I'm such a serial entrepreneur. Um, I get bored. I feel that when I've, if something's successful, if it's achieved its prime, I'm normally, then my energy dissipates and it's a really good time to think about other people stepping in. Now our businesses aren't sold, it's much more a case of recruiting new and competent directors who can take it forward and then stepping back. Uh, that's very much a case with shared future at the moment. Oh, I still sit on the board and I keep saying, no, you're not resigning, but I don't do any of the work anymore. I just help to set the strategy forward. And that's really because it's very successful. We work internationally. We work with the OECD, with the World Bank. We're working in Kenya at the moment, in Taiwan. It, it's doing all the thing that we set for it when we set it up. So I don't feel a need to be involved. At the moment, I'm involved in two new potential social enterprises because I feel that that's where my energy is best placed, is to help people get things going. I said before, it's never me. It's um, other people. It's working with teams of people. And it's when I feel that they've achieved success. I, I think that that is very interesting as someone who is not a serial entrepreneur. Um, Sue, do you have anything to, to add to that as well? I was, I was kind of reflecting when Matt was saying that because that's exactly the same for me. I leave organized. I, I, I've always been one of those people that goes to a charity when it's in trouble. I've been good at kind of getting things out of a hole, getting it sorted out, dealing with the governance issues, raising the profile, doing really great communications, building that reputation. And, and then I get bored and I move on to something else, which is kind of interesting. It's the same thing. <laughs> I think that that's a common theme. And then, of course, our franchise specialist. Um, I, I don't know how you decide. <laughs> yeah, I agree with them both. Um, I, yes, you do. I, I get bored with things. And um, I mean, uh, I'm not going to tell you how old I am now, but it, it's um, the number of times people say to me, Len, when are you going to retire? When are you going to pack it all in? And, and even now I'm coming up with ideas and, and, you know, my son says to me, Oh, dad, will you forget it? You know, retire, <laughs> you know, and I just, I'm, 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 you know, I'm already involved in two other companies. I've got shares in two other companies, um, which, which are being developed through franchising. Um, and, you know, they offered me shares in the business rather than just pay me, you know, a, a fee or whatever. Uh, and I'm just, I just, I just think, I think that nearly, I, I remember asking uh, at a group many years ago now, there's a group of uh, people in this, in this uh, business meeting and the other, two or three entrepreneurs and we were, they were interviewing them. And I asked the question that, and I was very young then, I was in my sort of twenties. And I said, I said to them, right, can you answer me this? Are entrepreneurs born 
or are they made? And every one of them said, born. And I think it's something that's in you. It, it's you, you either have it or you haven't. And, you know, you just, I'm constantly on the lookout for new things. And it, I just, I can't stop it. You know, it's just the way I am. And I, I do think it is, it is in people, certain people. You know, what, I, think, I think the thing you've got to remember from a student point of view, what you've got to remember is that not all, not all entrepreneurs are successful. You know, they're not. It's, um, there's many entrepreneurs who start businesses and fail, lots of them. Um, but, you know, there's also a lot who fail and start again and they succeed because they, they've always wanted it and it's that determination and motivation that makes them keep going. And, and come up with a new ideas and finding new ideas, you know. So that's that's my view anyway. That is is super fascinating. I've I've heard a couple of times actually that entrepreneurs, you know, are born with that gene, if you will, or that uh, ambition in some cases, and that others get bored. Um, I, I see Abbott that that you're back and you were asking him. So Abbott is from um, Team Sunshine from INCG in Algeria. I think she wanted to present her idea a little bit to you and get some feedback um, as far as, you know, how to better develop the idea. If that's okay, I'll give you a couple minutes, Abbott. Uh, thank you. This is so kind of you. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that all of you are in the field of business. I guess you know uh, well how it works. And I, I'm just 20 years old. I don't know these issues uh, a lot, but uh, yeah. So my, my idea was a smart, uh, a smart city, a smart city that works with solar panels. This smart city contains smart houses and uh, all of the, uh, everything smart around the world is uh, will, will be collected and uh, put in one one place which is a, a smart city and work with the solar energy i mean um, i i feel that it's our resp responsibility to uh, to save the world because i see that um, the pollution air pollution and the pollution is everywhere people don't know people people just running after the money and don't know uh, their responsibility against uh, the earth the earth is just i I feel that the earth is screaming just to, to, uh, to survive. And I feel that it's our responsibility also to build a new generation with the sense, the sense of being friendly to the nature, of not harming the nature anymore. So if you wanna, I want just uh, to know how, did, how can I develop this idea or how can I publish this idea around people? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abed. I, I know that's a large question and her idea was absolutely wonderful. So, um, Len, I see, and Matt, I see you're off mute if one of you want to um, take a stab at it. Yeah, just clarify what she said, because I found it a bit hard listening, to be honest. Oh, no worries. So her, her idea, and Abed, please feel free to um, correct me if I'm wrong, is um, is a, a smart city solution, um, solar panels, um, basically a solution that is bringing solar panels to emerging economies and making that a, a more profitable and um, economic form of, of um, energy. And what advice can you, you give to someone who has such a, a large idea? Um, Abed, I don't, if you want to add to that. Abed, I, I think your hand is raised. Well, if she would like to add, she can add, but, but with such a large idea. Hello. Yeah. Did you want to add to that? Yes, I want to add that um, the cars that in the city only works with uh, electrical cars. I mean, in the city, uh, there will be no source of pollution and we will build a new generation according to that with the sense of this uh, of this uh, act that's it so it sounds like it's going to be a little bit more of a political um endeavor as well so matt do you want to uh, yes i think it's fantastic the idea the concept is being developed in some parts of the world whether it's uh, in the new city that's being built outside dubai where they're trying that approach um 
to cities in the UK like Bristol who are trying to tie up the whole of the mechanism of running the city using smart technology, though not necessarily in the UK being solar powered. So part of what you need, I would suggest you need to do to develop that idea is to look at that research for what's going on already in other parts of the world so that you have some proof of the concept. The other part of it is it's very hard to sell a whole city solution. So perhaps what you need to think about is to break that idea down into small steps. So your overall goal is a solar powered smart city. What's the first stage? Could that be the initial business idea? Is it about um, the, the local manufacture of solar, solar power within Algeria? Or is it about the adoption of solar power within a particular area, particular locality? To prove each stage of the concept, it's wonderful to start with that huge idea, but I think that that can be really problematic and overwhelming for those who might support you. So my suggestion would be to think about breaking that down into small steps and to think of each of those as the development of a new business idea. I hope that's helpful. Um, I certainly found that helpful. Um, Len, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think I think what Matt said is is right. I mean, if you look at solar panels, for instance, if solar panels are so good and so economical over the long period and so on, you know, why don't they build new houses with solar panels already in? You know, that's a question I've asked before, and nobody seems to know the answer. I mean, why, if it's so good, why not build houses with solar panels already in them? Um, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, being talked about now about the uh, the climate and all the rest of it, and electric electric cars and and so on. And I think, well, I mean, I still think we have a long way to go. Um, I just, you know, if, if people are forced in this country to buy electric cars in in 2030, I think there's going to be a big problem, <laughs> massive problem. Um, you know, one way or the other. But, you know, long term, yes, all these ideas are good and, and they all make sense. And, and anything that affects the climate or, or the climate change is, is a good idea. But I think, you know, it, I just think it lead, needs a lot more discussion, a lot more talking about and a lot more um, information going forward. Agreed. And then... Sorry uh, for interruption. I just want to add that I have already put that in my project. So uh, everything, every single roof, all the roofs in the city are powered by solar panels. So, and there will be uh, in the center of the city uh, a, a, cen a center powered when, when, where all of the solar panels go there. And um, yes, there will be a technological, everything will be connected to the technology so that the new generation that is going to grow up in that city will be connected directly with technology. So maybe it will, uh, it will be a very new, new generation that brings us uh, things that we will never ex expect in our lives in this time. I see, I see. Uh, Sue, I know we're, um bumping up to time but if you have a couple extra minutes so I'd like to to hear what you have to say and then um Nathaniel I think would have a final question um if that's okay with everybody I know that we promised 45 minutes okay fine well I I just when you were talking about it I just had a real sense of your um, a real sense of purpose which I'm you know you probably can tell I'm a little bit obsessed with I think um or you know things ideas that are about kind of making the world a better place and working in a charity like I do. I think I just wondered whether um, it might be worth you having a look at whether you could find a charity that works in this field because very often they can enhance the reputation of a new business. So if you had, you know, almost like a corporate social responsibility aspect to your development of this idea it might be that you stand next to, um, you align yourselves with a charitable organization that might already have, a, have built a reputation in this 
in this um, in this field. Um, and if not, I actually thought you could create a great charity doing something like this yourself. You know, almost like a kind of um, a voluntary sector organisation where you know you you can you can attract different streams of funding. You could perhaps work with academics. You could. Um, I just I just thought that there was something in the way you spoke so passionately about your your project that would make it really suitable for for the kind of world where I work. So it's just a, just a suggestion, maybe think about partnering with a really great charity that might already be doing this to enhance the reputation of your new business right on the back of the stand on the shoulders of giants, maybe. <laughs> I absolutely love that and I agree. Nathaniel, I noticed you wanted to add a comment, which I think is excellent being you know, a peer. So please feel free to add um, a comment as well. Thanks, Mandy. Um, I wanted to just add a comment to what Matt had said about sort of staging um, an idea rather than trying to sell a full scale um, idea, which I think is great. Um, so using Apex as a case study, when we started in 2014 um, with an idea to essentially connect smallholder farmers directly to the buyers, um, a lot of people thought it was not going to be achieved or achievable at the time. But what we did was to break it into different elements. So set up the infrastructure, put all the things that are required. Um, now that we're making over $100 million in revenue, we now have access to the seats and can share more ideas. Um, and people are then listening now compared to um, when we started in 2014. So I think sequencing it and doing it in the right cadence always helps out. Wow, that was that was wonderful. Thank you so much. And I don't want to take any more of your time than I promised, but I would like to have the entrepreneurs um, and residents say just a couple more words, uh, final thoughts on um, advice for young entrepreneurs. Um, so. Please, the floor is yours. I suppose I'd just say keep going. Just keep having a go. And if you're going to fail, fail fast and get on to the next thing. But you do need a certain mentality. And I think we've discussed that. Maybe we all have that. <laughs> I love that. I love that, Lynn. I just, I just, yeah, I always, when I do presentations at, at Lancaster, I always end my presentations with, you know, whatever you do, do something that you enjoy. And I think that is so important. If you enjoy it, you'll give it 100% and, and you'll give it the best all the time. So, you know, whatever you do, do something that you enjoy. Couldn't agree more with that, absolutely. And then uh, Matt, final words? I'm thinking very much about your description of your project in Algeria and it's, <clears throat> To have that big dream is fantastic and it's what always motivates me, but it's about what's realistically achievable step by step to not think, oh, that's so big, I can't possibly achieve it. Yes, you can. You can start that journey. And if it's appropriate, you'll hand it over to others. If, but to keep hold of that dream, if you can achieve that dream or even the stages towards it, you make the world a better place. So that's my summation. Well, thank you. Thank you all to our entrepreneurs and residents. I mean, you have been such a positive influence, at least on me, and I, I believe the rest of the students who have been in and out of this session. Um, thank you so much for your time. And to all the students who came today, we are, we are so thankful for your participation in this um, competition and this opportunity. And we are just so impressed with all of the ideas and questions and and influence that you're, you're making on the world. So thank you all and um, hope to see you really soon. And if you are presenting in the top six teams, Leroy, I think you are, uh, good luck. You're going to do great. And to our entrepreneurs and residents, hope to see you all soon at a, a GBSN program or event. So thank you all. Have a wonderful um, morning, afternoon, and evening.